Hello, and thank you for joining us for this week's Ask Joe webinar. This week's uh, topic is on RTCM, and RTCM has been around for some time, and the goal of today's webinar is to explain the origination and the uses of a format that many of us use daily. If questions remain at the end of it, please ask Joe at the end of the presentation, and he'll be happy to answer your questions. So talking again today is Joe Sass, and uh, he will be uh, giving us the information on RTCM, which he knows quite a bit about. A little background on Joe, he's our channel development manager at Spectra Geospatial, and he's the application engineer that is uh, sort of the liaison between product marketing, sales, and engineering. He's got a degree in geography. It blends nicely with his passions for surveying, and since 98, he has been an, an active member of the California Land Surveyors Association, and uh, what helps him a lot today is since 2004, he began representing us within the RTCM Standards Organization, and he currently sits on the Board of Directors. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Sass, and thank you again for joining. Thank you, Mr. Binder. Joe Sass here. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera so I don't distract you with this mug of mine. hope that's okay with everybody. So what is RTCM? I remember when I first started in this business and we first started with RTCM, I thought, RTCM, what, is that, what does that mean? And in my mind, it stood for real-time correction messages. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that I, I found out RTCM did not stand for real-time correction messages. Uh, it stands for Radio Technical Commission for Maritime Services, which is a mouthful. Um, they began a long time ago. Uh, at, as a government agency, and basically their mission then and now is is the same. It's it's about safety. Primarily, it's about safety, and that's what the RTCM organization is about. Um, within the RTCM body, they do a lot of different things. You know, you can see things in the RTCM body that do not fall within our domain, like emergency beacon services and electronic charts. Um, and the survivor locating devices and, and other things that RTCM does, well, what it does affect us are these top three, the real-time GNSS data strains. That's what we commonly call RTCM. Uh, there's a whole new RTCM committee I'll talk about later with dealing with the radios. And then we know integrity and autonomy, you know, driverless cars and, and such are, are on the horizon. And that's another thing that RTCM is heavily involved in. They've been around since 1947. Back then, they were a governmental agency. Um, and in 1980, they became completely independent and supported by their members. Who are their members? They come from academia. They come from the military, manufacturing, universities. Uh, they're all over the, the place. And if you'll notice that bottom um, uh, bullet there, RTCM is an acronym and this industry is loaded with acronyms so don't feel bad if you don't understand what all of those uh, initials mean but those are just some of the liaisons so instead of just acronyms i thought maybe i'd put it up there um, in logo and i hope you notice that on this single page you see trimble you see topcon you see leica you see novatel uh, we're all competitors sapcorda we're competitors with each other, and yet we work together to create the RTCM standard. And that's an important thing to understand is that, you know, while we are competitors, we also recognize the need to be able to talk to each other. And uh, standards allow us to do that. Um, and, and outside of our industry, inside of our industry, um, governmental, non-governmental, you see ESRI up there. Next week is the ESRI user conference, virtual user conference. Um, Two of the logos on that previous page were, were governmental, like Lanta Matsuria. Uh, I always blow that, but that's the land surveying of Sweden. Um, the government references the RTCM standard into their laws. Um, so RTCM standards are used throughout the world through many, many different industries. Even though they started as a maritime-based organization, they have well exceeded the, those bounds. Uh, probably back around 1985, they started going outside the, the marine domain. So within RTCM, they have special committees. And a special committee basically takes on a problem, 
gets a panel of experts to talk about and discuss and solve the problem. Do some testing. The IO stands for interoperability or input output testing. Uh, everything goes well. We have to circle around this loop a few times. And then a standardization comes out. And, and the result of that standard is, is like sometimes policy. Um, you get a certain level of quality that's almost guaranteed by the standard. And, and the quality is, is demonstrated in the results. Uh, so this is basically the, the working model for a special committee of RTCM. Uh, and as I just said, they, they take a problem and they, they work at it in depth. This is the same as the previous slide, but just a little bit different pictorial. Uh, once the problem is solved, they develop and, and publish a standard. That's what you're looking at is the RTCM Special Committee 104 uh, Standard 3.3 for, for our industry. Um, and as the technology changes, the standard has to update it. Uh, the original RTCM standards were GPS only, and then GPS and GLONASS. And now we've got an emerging world of various constellations that have to be reflected into the standard. And that's what RTCM does, is, is make an industry voice, an English language, so to speak, for our industry, so that we can incorporate these signals and talk to each other. Sometimes, the work of these special committees, like in our business, in several countries, it's the law. You have to be RTCM3 compliant. Um, and, and then each of these special committees has a chairman. And the chairman is typically a subject matter expert, though not necessarily. Um, it, but he manages the, the discussion among subject matter experts. Uh, and, and the result is an outcoming standard. There are several, I think 15 in total, special committees of the RTCM organization. And I've bolded the ones that affect our industry. Uh, and when I say our industry, surveying, construction, GIS, um, building, all of, all of these types of uh, industries that I'm familiar with and that I work within and that Spectra uh, Geospatial typically works within. These are the three bolded committees that affect us. So 104 is what we have always called RTCM, and we will continue to call RTCM as it relates to our industry. Special Committee 134 was started about four years ago, and it's in this drive for autonomy. And then the radio layer of, of RTK is, is a mess. And, and so RTCM is trying to deal with that uh, through a standardization process. <clears throat> Excuse me. Special Committee 134, as I said, was started about four years ago. It's chaired uh, by Dr. Roberto Capua uh, out of uh, Italy, Rome, Italy. And he is managing all of these different elements that will go eventually uh, into autonomy. And, and if you look at the bottom there, it says rail, marine, navigation, and auto. And those are the not only the three primary drivers of autonomy and, and this whole standardization resolve, uh, but it's in that order. Rail is basically one dimensional. You're, you're on a rail and you go forward or backwards. Um, marine navigation is two dimensional uh, and usually not very congested. And then you've got auto, which will be the last of the autonomies, uh, the major autonomy shifts. Uh, obviously air is, is already there mostly, uh, but what do these words mean? And uh, that's part of the standardization process. What is the difference between should and shall? You know, and, and we've had, we've had day long discussions like that uh, within the standards body. Special Committee 135, uh, I've done a lot of training in my career, 20 years. And when I teach a class about GNSS or RTK, I, I ask people in the class to raise their hands if you've ever had UHF problems. In, typic, in a typical class, everybody raises their hand. Uh, UHF with Satel is different from UHF with PacCrest is different from UHF with Parkson is different from, you name the company, AR West, Micro Circuits. There's, there's no standard surrounding this whole layer of transporting data over the air. And so um, I have been involved, Joe, Joe Binder mentioned it in my introduction. On my first day on this job, my boss, uh, in my office orientation, one of the first things he said to me, Joe, you're our new representative on the RTCM committee for the company. 
And so I had to go and look up how to spell RTCM. And when he said RTCM, he meant Special Committee 104. And so since that time, I've been working uh, on that committee and I currently serve as, as the Secretary of Special Committee 104. Uh, and because of my experience, I was asked to chair the Special Committee 135. And so I would say we're about halfway through the cycle of producing a standard uh, where we can actually agree on radio settings so that TopCon can work with Leica, can work with Trimble, can work with Spectra. You see that interoperability, that's the big one. And that's what the standards do. They ensure that brand A works with brand B. And that's the whole purpose, not the whole purpose, but a big purpose of the standards. So here's an actual picture of Special Committee 104 in work. Uh, in process, if you look across at the far side of the table, second person in, that's me. Uh, I'm chair, I'm secretary, sitting next to the chairman, and next to me are two of the Trimble engineers from Moscow. Uh, next to them is John Deere, and then Novotel, and then um, Wuhan Navigation, and, and Topcon, and around the table we go. It doesn't matter what company we're in, uh, we're there to solve problems, and that's what we do. We typically meet three or four times a year in plenary. Uh, and you can see this was taken in May of 2018. I don't remember where. Uh, and we develop standards surrounding different topics. And you can see these topics listed there on the left. There are working groups within the special committee. So when the working groups tackle these, these specific problems, like how do we implement QZSS, the, the Japanese system, into the standard? How do we make NMEA compliant with the standard or, or cooperative with the standard? And, and I don't need to read those biases is an interesting one. It used to be that, that we would tell users if you're working brand A with brand B, turn off GLONASS. And the reason was because there were GLONASS biases that we didn't understand. Jean-Marie Sluwagen from Septentrio, him and his team there, they discovered the solution, presented it at an ION conference, voila, that, that uh, working group was created and we solved the bias problem with Lotus. I'll talk about some of these. Version two was the original RTCM standard. And I, I say that tongue in cheek, version one was a disaster. And the reason version one was a disaster was because there was no interoperability testing. And we didn't realize, I guess, or they didn't realize way back then, 1981, 82, something like that, uh, that interoperability was a big, key player in this. So version two was the version that started making RTK possible. Now, if you jump down to the bottom two bullets, it only supported GPS and GLONASS, and it was only resolved down to a centimeter. Back then, GPS was a meter level system at best with WAS at very best. And uh, the government was, was at that time using selective availability. So if you just use the signal from space, it was 100 meters of accuracy. The, the marine community was looking to just navigate ships. So a centimeter was great. But when we started applying it to RTK and realizing that that centimeter of granularity was not enough, um, we realized that maybe we needed something better than version two. However, version two by then was well established in the marine community, meaning millions and millions of vessels rely on the RTCM2 corrections to get their in-port navigation. That has changed recently, uh, and the beacon systems uh, throughout the United States and, and increasingly throughout the world are being decommissioned. So at some point, version two may become obsolete, but it remains a standard that is in use. Um, notice also this blue piece of paper there on the right. That is an actual paper version. It's an electronic version now, but this is something that's paid for. Uh, you can buy the, the standard document, or you can be an RTCM committee member organization, and then you have access to these standards. So this is something I have in my computer because I'm a member of Trimble Spectra, and we are an organization that pay month or yearly dues to be a part of RTCM. Uh, but if you were to ask me for a copy of it, I could not provide it to you. Version three, this is the most current version of the RTCM standard today as it relates to our industry. It's a lot more efficient than version two. The, the way the messages are compiled, uh, it has more integrity. It supports network RTK. What do I mean by network RTK? VRS, for instance, Trimble technology to create the virtual reference station. Um, 
it supports that that ability supports all the constellations just a note there the, the working group chairman is from novatel and that's fine he's a phd he does great work cameron um and i kind of that bottom bullet I'm kind of laughing microsoft word which is what i use to record the meeting summary notes because i'm secretary interoperability is a hard word to type and so I have got a uh, word to learn that when I type in IO space, put in the word interoperability for me because it's too hard to type. And we use that word all the time within the discussions because that's a major part of what we do is we make sure that things work together. Uh, the message types. This is a typical RTCM stream of data coming out of a base station or a, a network um, provider, I, a network uh, GNSS server. Uh, correction provider. And you can see that there's some type of homogeneity with the numbering system, 1074, They make sense. And within those, so if you were to look at whatever message 1075 is, it would be the same as 1085, 1095, et cetera. So it's, it's well organized, uh, but this is the, the typical stream at the typical rate. Notice that the, the rover has to have the receiver the base station antenna information and it also needs to know the base station coordinates in order for the rover to fix and we'll talk about the state space representation later in case you don't understand that transformation parameters are interesting we'll, we'll talk about that so most of us today are familiar with the term entra but where did that come from it came directly from rtcm why did it come from rtcm because people wanted to make money and they needed a standard that would support that money making uh, business model, right? In the early days, you, you used UHF radios and we still use UHF radios broadly around the world, uh, but anybody who has a receiver that can receive that frequency can use those corrections. So the next generation we used, you know, just phone calls, dial 408-853-1010 and the base station would answer its SIM card phone number and it would send corrections to that, to that call out rover. Uh, it was limited to point to point and it started becoming expensive and the circuit switch data technology aged and increasingly service providers do not provide that CSD service anymore. So we, we then switched to GPRS, right? We've heard that edge and L4, 4G and, and LTE and all of these, the internet matured. So we were able to use this internet protocol to transport data but in the earliest days, direct IP was the only option. You put in a port ID, uh, an IP address and a port, and uh, you could connect to that base station, but there was no way to make money with that. And so Entrop was developed, which provided for username and password, and that makes all the difference. The username and password assignment, uh, unauthorized users cannot get access to the data stream. Um, Entrop also then allowed these, these technologies like VRS and FKP to be inserted into the data stream increasing the, the efficiency of the networks providing the corrections. And Entrop version two exists, but to our knowledge, there's only about three implementations in the world. And uh, we, we discussed this in, in plenary session and it just came out, I think a guy from a, an engineer from TopCon, he says, you know what, version one is good enough. And so version one has problems. Version one, you look at the source table and it says it's at zero, zero, which is off the Ivory Coast of Africa and the Atlantic Ocean because people are not forced to put in a valid uh, latitude and longitude. Sometimes people in the Western Hemisphere miss the minus sign on the longitude, so it looks like they're in Asia. Uh, there's all kinds of problems with version one, but it works and it, it allows service providers to make money, so it's good enough. MSM, I was, uh, I was present for the start, beginning and end of this full message. Um, development through the standards committee. It was a special committee for MSM. It was eventually called multiple signal messages, but originally we called it the Aztec proposal, which was the name of my company at that time. And my engineers from uh, Moscow, Russia, came up with this generic approach to describe any satellite constellation so that uh, it didn't just, wasn't just special to GPS and GLONASS, which version 3.1 and 3.0 are, but it was generic to all constellations. And as India develops one, we'll, we'll have support for India. If, if Nigeria develops their system, we can develop a, an MSM for Nigeria. So it was an open-ended system that allowed us to address the emerging um, 
satellite signals that are available from space. Not only are the satellite numbers increasing, but the signals from these satellites are also increasing. And we needed a quick way to answer the industry call for support of these signals. And so that's what MSM does. Um, and it was about a five-year process, maybe a little more uh, from beginning to end to get this from uh, initial proposal through interoperability all the way to standardization. We've standardized on the signals from Beidou, Galileo, and QZSS. Understand that Trimble has their own answer. You know, the we've got two answers: one from the Aztec stream, one from the from the German, the sorry, Terasat perspective. Leica has their own perspective. We needed a common language, and, and RTCM answered this need for all of us to be able to talk together, uh, regardless of the constellation that's being broadcast. To signals. This is uh, becoming more and more common in other parts of the world. I have not seen any implementations here in the U.S., but this really is an interesting one because an internet service provider can remove all of the geodesy from using GPS in this technique. We can make site-specific coordinate systems if we wanted to. We can make uh, legally described coordinate systems available and all the user has to do is turn on their rover. No site calibration, no coordinate system selection. Everything comes over the air from the network provider. Uh, and it then allows, let's say I'm on a construction site and there are several crews out there using GPS. Each one had to, had to um, localize or calibrate to their site. So they're all slightly different. And in this technique, if the, if the data and coordinate transformation uh, parameters are coming out over the air, everybody is exactly the same. So there's no transformation irregularities. State space representation. This is, uh, a, it's also sometimes called a PPP, precise point positioning, but it basically is trying to make GNSS data um, that can resolve down to, let's say the size of a softball, six to 10 centimeters in diameter, anywhere in the world, anytime. Not all conditions, but most conditions, right? If you look closely at this picture, the lady is doing her homework while the car is driving down the road. And that's really one of the driver's autonomy. Going back to Special Committee 134, Special Committee 134 actually started in Special Committee 104, but quickly realized that the, the scope of the work was too large to be a special committee, so a uh, working group, so it became its own special committee. This is a almost completely hidden aspect. Some core station, especially the ones that were part of the uh, US Coast Guard Beacon Network, when they send out corrections, they actually send out corrections to a local reference station, which then checks to make sure the corrections are valid before sending them out over the air. In this way, you have no outliers. Uh, you have an integrity level that's much higher than just a single base or a network broadcasting RTK corrections. Um, SOLAS, safety of life at sea. This is, uh, again, U.S. Coast Guard designed system here, and it was designed to make sure that it would not broadcast bad information, could not be spoofed. Um, some of that has changed, and with the decommissioning of the U.S. Coast Guard beacon stations, this standard may become less relevant in the US, but still has relevancy throughout the world as other countries have coastal beacon systems that utilize this model. This is an, an interesting page, uh, especially the, uh, the fourth bullet down there, fifth bullet, the divergent interests. Um, we're competitors in many instances working on a common goal. But sometimes those common goals are at odds with each other and priorities and, and business um, pressures and business models and other things get in the way sometimes of what's best. And so I've often said that, that standards represent the best compromise. And I would say that the technology of my company, Spectra Geospatial, and the, the technology of Trimble, uh, my parent company, is by far, at least maybe not by far, but in some ways, yes, better than the RTCM standard. However, like I can't read my Atom format or my CMRX format, they can read my RTCM format. 
Um, and so again, while it may not be the best compression or the best uh, efficiency, it, it represents something that we can agree upon. And I think that's important. Innovation versus maturity versus standardization. You know, at what point do you consider the Indian satellites to be mature enough to standardize? It's an evolving developing system. There are signals coming from space that can be used. At what point do they become standardized? At what point are they mature enough to be standardized? Um, and at what point is the, is the engineering innovation mature enough to be standardized? So those three are kind of tied together and they're not easy to answer. Committee cadence, that's another one. Special Committee 104 has been in, in existence, I think, since 1984. So it's been around for, for almost 40 years. And that by itself introduces some type of, of um, expectation that things don't move rapidly. Sometimes they do. A Special Committee 135 to solve the radio problem, they want to get a problem out to market fast. They want it to be right, they want it to be correct, but they want it to be fast. So the cadence of 135 is much different than the cadence of a Special Committee 104 about which this conversation is mostly concerned. Two very closely related standards to our industry um, are NMEA and, and RINEX. RINEX is, is raw data, in the English language of raw data, right? Um, everybody, my, my raw data format is called Atom. Uh, the Trimble raw data format is TO2. Uh, but both of us have utilities that can convert those files into a RINEX format. And that means that it can go to Opus. It can go to a competitive piece of software. It can go to a generic piece of software. It can go to Ospos. It can go to NRCAN. Uh, so RINEX is a, is a recognized format throughout the world developed by the International GNSS Service. Um, and they develop standards, and RINEX is one of those. Uh, NMEA, you know, a lot of our equipment is hooked up to, say, ground penetrating radar or bathymetric studies, or, or other types of sensors that require location and quality inputs. And that's what NMEA does. It takes the output of a typical rover receiver uh, in a standardized format that 99% of third-party equipment uh, that can use GNSS location uh, in an acceptable format. I show you the, the definition of the GGA message there, which is one of the most popular of the NMEA. Um, sentences. It's also interesting. I say NMEA, you'll, you'll often hear it called NEMA. Uh, and there is another standards organization called NEMA, and an -E NEMA, but uh, it is actually NMEA, National Marine Electronics. So why standards? Um, you can compare things. Apples to apples, same language. That's one thing. Um, reconcile regional differences into a global system. There are, there are different regional needs that evolve. For instance, this uh, idea of, of transmitting the RTCM datum or the datum and the transformation information. It's, it's right and it's time for Central Europe or Western Europe and for parts of Asia. It's not right yet for us. So uh, as, as the US gets to a system or a time or a maturity or wants to adopt a coordinate system that's transported over the air, we will be ready to receive it. Uh, the fact that it has the RTCM stamp of approval has some level of credibility. RTCM has been around a long time, and people recognize that it has it has credibility and it has prestige. Um, you see, I list other standards organizations that are equally recognized. Under, Underwriters Laboratory there at the bottom is is as important to us as RTCM is to a surveyor. Um, they save lives because we're all on one page, because we've done interoperability studies, there is no chance of us getting something wrong. Uh, and that's important. I, I say define minimal competencies. That's the same thing as what I just said. It's, it's, the, it's the industry consensus of compromise. This is, this is acceptable. It may not be the best. We may not be using interleaving or, or whatever it is, the technology of the day, but it works and it's interoperable and we can depend on it. So, that's why standards, they, they are an important part of our life. They surround us. If you look at the back of your phone, you'll probably see one or two of these standards organizations that I've listed there on the back of your phone, on your blender, on your oven, on your car, they're, they're everywhere. And uh, RTCM is the standards organization that I think makes most, uh, has most relevance to especially the surveying industry, but users in general of GNSS. So, 
with that, I'd like to thank you for your uh, participation, your attendance, and uh, I'd be happy to open it up to any kind of questions. Well, there have been no questions come in, but uh, Joe, thank you, very informative. And if there are any questions that anybody has and you'd like to uh, present them to us later, you can uh, email Joe Sass at Joe underscore Sass, S-A-S-S, -S, at Trimble.com, or myself, Joe underscore Binder, at Spectra Precision or Trimble.com. Thank you very much, and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.